It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators. The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here is Douglas Coleman. Hey, 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 he, 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 ha. Welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show. It's me, Douglas Coleman. Thank you for joining us. Nice to have you here. Justin Peck is here today. Justin Peck is a professional race car driver with the Lucas Oil Off-Road Racing Series. He's also the owner of a Race Pro Technology Race Team. And he's written a book called Bulletproof which is his story of overcoming severe bipolar disorder, addiction, and the daily struggles with both diseases. Justin also has a pretty amazing story to tell about an attempted suicide uh, in which the gun just didn't go off. I think if that wasn't a wake-up call, I don't know what would be. But he'll tell us all about it in the interview. He will be up in just a few minutes. Before we get to Justin, we've got two songs to play. First one up is by George Hendrickson. And George has been writing songs since he was 17. He founded a band called The Works. During the 80s, he worked playing around New York City. Uh, In 1995, he released a three-song EP called Extraordinary Dreams. And he's got a new song out now called Don't Close Your Eyes, which we're going to play. The second song we've got to play today is by The Mystics. The Mystics are an alternative rock dream pop indie band from South Texas whose members are Angel on guitar and lead vocals, Caleb on drums and vocals, and Chris on lead guitars. The song we're going to play for you today is called Broken City Lights. So, first to the music, and then to the interview with Justin Peck.
You're listening to Mr. Smooth and Savvy right here on the Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. Acclaimed author of Garden, Jane Yates brings you the first book in a new trilogy, Octopus Pirate, a story of a foundling who has unusual talents, such as the ability to communicate with octopuses. As a baby, he was washed up on an island off the Scottish mainland. An eccentric former nun who lives alone with cats brings him up. He joins a circus and narrowly escapes plots against him. Flees to Cornwall, builds a replica pirate ship that's also an airship to travel back in time to fight real pirates. Get your copy today from Amazon, only 99 cents. Hi there, this is Stuart Epps from the UK, record producer, engineer. Uh, You might have heard of me. I've worked with artists from Elton John to Led Zeppelin to uh, Bad Company, Twisted Sister, Robbie Williams, Oasis, many, many great bands and artists in the past and the present and uh, hopefully in the future. But uh, you can work with me as well. You know, all you've got to do is get in touch with me on epsmusicproductions.com. That's uh, E-double-P-S productionsmusic.com. Uh, and I can help you with your productions and with your recordings. Uh, a lot of people do home recordings now, which you can only take so far. Maybe they need a bit of professional help. So uh, get in touch with me and we can sort it out. And thanks for Douglas Coleman for giving me the spot. Thanks a lot. Cheers, bye. And now... Hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. But- See? Nothing up my sleeve. Presto! <laughs> Wrong hat. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. Okay, please welcome Justin Peck. Hi, Justin. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. How are you? Uh, very good. Thank you for coming on the show. I was reading over your bio. You've uh, done a lot of pretty amazing things, interesting things. Uh, you've had a colorful life so far, I guess would be a euphemism to use. Not always great. Hey. Had some tragedy. Let's just start at the beginning, shall we? Let's go to your background. Tell us about uh, your growing up and where you grew up and then how you got interested in racing. And then we'll talk about your book. Oh, okay, so you want to go way back. All right, I was <laughs> born on June 19th at 4.34 p.m. on the afternoon. I do know that for a fact. All right. So, <laughs> I... um bipolar disorder um i have had the opportunity to be blessed with um a mental illness and when i say blessed i mean that in every sense of the word um too many people out there victimize themselves and think that because they have a mental disorder or they have something else going on with them um that they are are entitled to become a victim and um that is just not me and that's not the things that I teach. Um, we are all here um, for a purpose. There are always defining moments in our lives that, that give us the opportunity to, be, uh, to become bigger and better than we were yesterday. So uh, the constant strive to be better than you were yesterday is, is, for me, is very important. And it's very important for me to explain that to people and to be able to kind of convey my life experiences um, with that um, because hopefully one day um, if I ever find someone at the top of the canyon um, kind of giving up um, type stuff, they'll be able to think of my stories and, uh, and think to themselves, man, if that guy can do it, I can do it as well. Tell us what bipolar is for some people that might not know what it is. So bipolar, I do a lot of race car analogies. Um, uh, So I've been racing um, for 24 years now. Um, I've been a pro driver for about eight. Uh, And so a lot of the things that I I talk about and how I kind of do the analogies are all race car, but I'm slowly starting to realize that not, not very many people understand race car talk. <laughs> so uh, so I, I I have to try to think of other things. So um, well, what basically goes on in my brain is if you think of a regulator, right? So you've got 
Um, and this really isn't having to do anything with race cars, but it's um, it's like an air regulator. So you've got, let's say, 100 pounds of pressure going in one end, and then the regulator separates um, that pressure out to lower pressure amounts um, in two separate parts. Well, in my brain, my regulator, my chemical regulator, is broken. And so... I get a huge influx of chemical base stuff, um, whether it be dopamine, serotonin, um, DMT, all of the all of the crazy things that, that kind of make you lose your mind sometimes. Um, I get a huge dump of those um, all at once, and so what that does is that puts me into a mania stage. So mania um, is for me it's the absolute best thing on the planet. Um, I don't ever really fully think that I'm ever in a mania stage and that I ever think anything's wrong. I'm very productive. Um, I I can speak very fluently. I, I have a good, good head on my shoulders. I've made, like I physically have made more money um, financially while I'm on my manic phase than I have any other time of my life. The crazy thing about having bipolar is that the world um, and our universe always finds a way of balancing itself out. And so because I go through these crazy highs, I am pretty much destined to have a pretty bad low as well. So that's the flip side of uh, bipolar. So I go through a depressive state that, uh, that can last some time as well. So the difference between a class one and a class two bipolar is a class two bipolar is a short acting cycle effect. So you'll have a, uh, a depressive state for let's say two or three weeks, and then you'll go through mania for two or three weeks, and then back to depression and so on and so forth, um, which is hard to control. I like for me, I couldn't even imagine it. Um, class one bipolar, um, even though they do say that it's harder to live with because it can be more self-destructive by by a lot. I'll go through six months to a year of having just horrible, no self-worth and no motivation to do anything in this world. And all I really want to do is lay in my bed and try to come up with the ideas that I have floating around and and write them down. So, like I stated before, it's the, uh, when someone has this type of disorder, we don't necessarily know that we have it. So, for me, I have to rely a lot on my, on the people that love me and that surround me, um, so they can they know when I when I start acting a little goofy, and then once I once I realize it, once I put two and two together, <clears throat> then I that's when I go back to the doctor. We adjust medication, and uh, and we kind of go from there. So when you say mania, what exactly do you mean by that? Give me like an example of what a mania situation would be for you. All right, mania for me. Um, it is one of those things that is kind of hard to explain. I, I typically use the race car analogies on this one, but um, uh, for the listeners, um, one of the ways that I can e- explain it is um, imagine, like, imagine yourself coming home from a party or from a friend's house or just somewhere that, like, late at night, let's say midnight, and you pull into your driveway and it's dark outside um there's no lights on in the house and you go to your front door you unlock the front door you walk in and you've got this eerie kind of feeling that like you know someone's there but you can't see anything no one should be there it's dark and so so you get that nervousness and that your heart starts to race and you start that's the adrenaline starting to to slowly pick up well imagine walking through your house for 10 or 15 minutes and having this 
exponential growth of adrenaline starting to pump through your body, and then all of a sudden, out of the out of the blue, one of your kids or one of your friends or somebody jumps out from behind the back of the couch or the the stairwell or something and scares you. So it's in that moment and that moment alone, that feeling of being completely adrenaline drained in a matter of seconds is that's what I crave. I love that. I love that feeling. And and so that's why, you know, when it when it's an adrenaline dr- junkie, I get it, it's really what it is. I, um, I I try to put myself in those situations where I can get the full adrenaline um, jump, and what it does is it it keeps me very very high focused. It keeps me on point. It keeps me from doing anything crazy. It keeps me from being in my bed all the time. Um, there's, you know, of course, a lot more that goes along with it, but, but for the for the person who doesn't have to physically experience it themselves, that's what we go through. And then for those people who experience it through someone else's eyes, so like a spouse or a um, or a significant other, um, hopefully my book and the things that I talk about can help them as well. I just want to go back to your analogy again. So the arriving at home and having the feeling, it's like a paranoia that you think somebody's in the house or somebody's going to try to hurt you. It, this comes on just randomly, like you, you have no control. All of a sudden you just get this overwhelming sense. Is that kind of the idea? Yeah, yeah, and it's, and it's not so much of... of you know, being you know worried about getting hurt or worried about any of that stuff. Um, so going through my years um, and then having multiple um, diagnoses for bipolar, um, I've had my blood taken probably seventy times just to try to make sure that we get the right meds in and and try to 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 make sure that we get exactly what we need to help help the disorder progress. The one thing about having the disorder and jumping into those phases is that I am not a victim. Um, here again, I'm blessed with the disorder. Um, I would not be the man I am today without the disorder. People that surround me, um, my mother and my girlfriend and my children and the people that love and care about me, if they didn't understand who I was um, they would have a hard time being around me because honestly I feel like I'm normal I think everything's just fine but I guess I apparently act a little bit like a goofball and I don't mean to it's just it's I'm just very super motivated I will I'll be done with work throughout the day I'll be done with work at 10 11 o'clock at night I'll come home I'll do book work until two or three or four in the morning, and then you know we'll start one of my other companies, do book work on that, and then maybe get one more company for the night, and just kind of keep going that way. So honestly, like it's like I said before, honestly, I typically don't know that I'm ever in a mania phase or a manic phase. It has to be actually brought to my attention. Okay, so the people that are around you, the people in your life, like you said, your mother, your children, they kind of have to be the watchdog for you to some degree. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. They, um, if I don't get the opportunity to see my kids as much as I should be or having my my ex-wife, um, if she doesn't have the chance to, to kind of keep her eye on me um, if I don't have my PR um, companies and uh, you know the girls that do the stuff for me on that end if I don't have those people looking out for me then I do have the chance of, of falling without me even knowing 
In your bio, there is uh, something about a turning point, I would guess, where you tried to commit suicide, that you actually put a gun to your head, but the gun didn't go off. Yes. Uh, now, wh when was so that? It, How long ago was that? How old were you when that happened? Uh, so I, uh, so it happened in 2000. Um, I was just going through typical struggles, right? I mean, see, that's, that's the craziest thing about the, how the disorder works is I go through the same struggles as everybody. You know, mine are just a little bit different. Um, you know, I have to react to them in, in a different way. But, you know, for the most part, I think us as humans and us as growing animals that want to evolve into becoming um, better than we were yesterday, we all struggle with some type of, of issue or struggle. Um, for me, you know, I was, I'm still blessed with, with having the, the bipolar disorder. And so kind of how the story goes with, with me realizing is I ended up, um, after a long day's work, I ended up at the top of the canyon that I had been to quite often in the past. Anyway, so normal day, um, wanted to do some some paperwork, but I needed to check on my job sites first. And so I get up, I leaned over and I kissed my wife. I got in the shower like I did every morning. Um, I got out, I put my pants on the same way that I did the day before. And uh, I went upstairs and kissed my children. And then I walked out back and grabbed my dog and threw my dog in the back seat. And we went out for our drive. It was always good to have my dog around because she was kind of my, my silent companion. She wouldn't argue with me. She wouldn't yell at me. <laughs> she could just sit there and listen to music with me and, and, just, and just be my companion. Yeah, dogs so, are great that way. Yeah. And as my dog was running around, I, I just got this really huge, overwhelming sense of despair something that I'd never felt that deeply about and I just in one moment of irrational thinking I went over to the glove box I pulled out my um, my 45 caliber pistol and I and I caught the trigger back and put it to my head and I pulled the trigger and um I'm telling you, man, there's, uh, there's very few things in life that I feel like we ever get second chances for. And it was at that moment that I realized that that was a huge defining moment for me. And that was something that now I felt, me personally, I felt that I was given a reason. I was given a path to be where I'm at today. Immediately after, when you pulled the trigger and the, the gun didn't fire, did everything change at that moment in your head? Yes, yes. Everything um, actually did change. So when the trigger didn't go off, um, what I did is I, is I unchambered the bullet because, I, you know, of course I think like anybody, I would think, you know, I thought to myself, geez, like how the heck can you screw this up too? This was supposed to be an easy task. All you had to do was move your move your index finger, and everything would be done. So, I unchambered the bullet, and the bullet flipped it, flipped out, and landed in my lap. And I had grabbed the bullet, and I picked it up. But I picked it up, and I looked at the firing pin. The firing pin actually hit, and to this day. We just don't understand why why it physically never went off. Hmm. And and it was from that moment on where I kind of looked at things and had kind of a different perception on life. Um, that if God or my higher power chooses to put enough time and energy into me by saving my life, then I have a responsibility back. And that responsibility is that of 
helping as many people as I can to be able to be a support structure and to be able to be a shoulder to cry on and someone that can carry them through the sand instead of walking and all the all the, the, the religious things that, that we hear throughout the day you know I wanted to be able to be that person that you know 40 years from now someone can look back and find my goofy face on YouTube and they can say you know what that guy right there that is the guy that changed my life he's the reason why I have grandkids or I have babies or you know those type of things yeah for me it's all the bipolar side of things it's not about making money um, it's all about helping brand awareness and I'm trying to kill the stigma um, you know I'm still trying to make a little bit of money doing it of course um, I did go self self publish on it so I don't I'm not bound by a bunch of laws and stuff on that but so but yeah so you know and then you know I do have other businesses as well you know I've got a supplement company I've got a couple construction companies um, I'm huge into mental health advocacy and and you know stuff like that I own uh, an Amazon company as well so I've got a lot of irons in the fire for sure mm -hmm. um, which is good because it it always keeps me keeps me, mo me motivated it's when I wake up in the morning when I feel like I do not want to get out of bed I know that I have to because I have a lot of people relying on me so and I for me I actually like that I like the stress of knowing that that I'm the breadwinner for a lot of people tell us a little bit how you got into race car driving at what point did you decide that that was going to be something you wanted to do so it was uh, I think we were probably uh, 1992, either 92 or 91. Um, there was a an indoor stadium arena um, that they typically used for horses, um, where the horses would run around in barrels and stuff. Well, they used it for um, a, a really big event. Um, that was supposed to be hosted like a couple of days after we, after me and my dad was there, and so the event that they were holding was an off-road. Um, back then, I think it was called the Mickey Thompson Off-Road Experience or something. We stayed and watched that, and talk about for me, talk about one of the most incredible things you've ever seen in your life. Oh, I love that. I love that more than I can even explain. So yeah, I started racing. Um, that kind of took a lot of um, a lot of the depression side of things out. It, it started giving me the adrenaline back that I wanted. Um, there's just something about uh, you know I can take big pharma all day long. I have medication I need to take. I get that, but I also do a lot of holistic medicine as well. Um, doing the things that that will help my my personal gut health and my personal mind health, and I've kind of found that it's almost that type of of medicine seems to always work a little bit better. What kind of cars are you racing? You said off road. Yes, off road. So I am that guy that. Uh, so I'm sure some of the listeners. Well, actually, I'm going to say I'm sure most of the listeners um, have heard of like the Baja 1000. So we start at uh, at Ensenada, Mexico, and then this year, because it's the 50th anniversary, um, we started the day at the top of the peninsula, and then we drive all the way down to the very bottom of the peninsula, and then come back up um, about 40 miles in, and then 40 miles back out, and that's the end of the race. So you've got, um, this year is supposed to be, I think, 370 drivers. So it's, it's honestly, it's one of those races that you just have to do. If, if you're an off-road guy at all, it's just, you have to do it. How long does it take to complete the course? Um, kind of depending on the course. 
So we've, we've got some that are, are fairly short, and they've got, uh, so one of the, one of the longest ones uh, is called the, the Drakkar Rally, um, and that's kind of through like Saudi Arabia and that type of stuff. Yeah, that of is, um, that's typically like a seven to eight day race. Oh, wow. um, but in that in that type of format, you only drive a couple hundred miles a day, and then you stop, and then you can eat, and you can you can do it that way, which which is all fine and good to me. It seems a little boring. <laughs> I when I race, I like to be able to get in, put my helmet on, and then just smash the my right foot to the ground and never lift. I like I like to go fast and I like to keep that going, you know, as much as I can. So in the in the Baja stuff, um one of the next races we have is uh, it's called Las Vegas Torino, Nevada. So we load all of our trucks up, we come to Las Vegas. Um I get rooms for all my guys and just to explain to them that they need to be at the truck ready to go by 10 a.m. If they're 10.01, they're going to get left. <laughs> so, um, but they're, you know, I'm, I'm pretty fortunate to have the crew that I have. They, um, they're very responsible and they're very, very good at what they do. And so, um, yeah, I mean, we have all the guys, um, you know, I support the full team, um, and um, I can't ever say it enough. It's I'm a I'm a grown man living the dream. So we got to mention your book. At some point, you wrote a book called Bulletproof. The book yes. is autobiographical. It it basically covers your uh, your life through bipolar and yes. racing and everything. Okay. Yes. Yes, that's correct. All right, when did you write the book? Um, so I actually started the book. So it was about 11 and a half, 12, 11 and a half to 12 years ago. Okay. Um, my, youngest, my youngest brother, um, he had overdosed on methadone and oh. ended up killing himself. Uh, wow. We don't think it was on purpose, but you know, at the end of the day, you never really know. Um, you know, I, for me and our family, we loved Kobe more than anything. Um, he was the one child in the family that was always a handful. Um, there's always one kid in every single family that is kind of a punk. Not gonna lie. So, Kobe happened to be. It took more effort. To just to calm him down than it did to take and put him away in his room and then try to go eat. And so, uh, what? I apologize. What was the question? I got a little sidetracked. That's all right. I was just going to ask you: Did he have the same disorder as you did? Or no, you no. Well, um, I don't. I don't think that he does. Um, so I have four. I have four children. Uh, I have, uh, yeah, four children and then four grandbabies. And so um, I do know that my youngest, um, my youngest boy, um, he he is showing every single last sign and symptom that I did when I was his age. And so I know that he'll, that he'll live with it as well. Um, but here again, like I said before, it's a blessing for him. Um, it's not easy by no means. There's a lot of there's a lot of struggle. You have to be very very comfortable with yourself and who you are. Um, but I think that with um, Dylan pushing through and having his daddy being able to guide him through those circumstances and situations, I think it's going to be a big help for him. Um, for me, when I was doing it, I didn't, I didn't ever seek medical medical attention. I I figured that I was strong enough that I could do it myself, and for the most part, I did. You know, there were a few times where I kind of had, had had given up. You know, I um, when my my youngest brother Kobe passed away, 
I wanted to have a legacy that my children could read about their dad about. So I started writing, and 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 please keep in mind, I barely have a high school um, education. I graduated with a 1.8, not book smart at all. But what I've done in that period of time is I've read um, a total of two books in my entire life, just two. I read a book in junior high that was required, and then I've read my own personal book. Wow. So so educationally-wise, um, I may not be as smart as the next guy, um, but I'll take my life experience and the college of actual life itself I'll take that experience over book smarts all day long. Book smart is only half of the equation anyways. I think people put a little bit yeah, too much exactly. too much more stock in books. Not to say that books aren't good and not to say that being book smart isn't something worthy to pursue, but it's only half the course. You know, there's a lot of exactly. people that are very book smart that haven't a clue what's going on outside in the real world. And people that have that genuine experience oftentimes come out a more well-rounded person. Uh, we got to kind of just move this along a little bit. So the last thing I wanted to ask you, so now you've got a couple of companies. You had mentioned construction companies, things. I've got Lucas Oil Off-Road Racing Series, so that must be your race car company, right? Yeah, th- th- that's actually the this, this series promoter for for the short course racing that I do, okay. um, I do I I do a few different types of racing. The short course is more of where we can have you know fifty to sixty thousand fans sitting in grandstands and they can watch us go around the track and beat on each other and <laughs> you know crash and catch on fire and stuff like that. So and then the desert stuff, of course, you know that's that you know you show up when I come into the pits. I get a quick splash of fuel and maybe a tire change, and then I leave, and then they don't see me for six hours. So, so it's 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 different forms of racing, but still kind of the same concept with the trucks. Okay, and you've also are the founder of Gear Forty Nine Motorsports Nutrition. What is that about? Yes. Uh, so um, being and understanding um, how bipolar disorder works and how actually most mental illnesses how they work and how they they function in the brain what I've come to realize and there's a ton of research to back this is that your gut health um, the stuff that we actually process through our body that has a huge direct reflection on who we physically are so if you have the correct amount of glycogen, um, which is uh, like energy-based sugars and, and those type of things, so if you have the proper amount of glycogen in your body and you are, you're extremely hydrated like you should be and you don't have pain from you know, random injuries or, or any of that, it affects the brain. And it affects it in a positive manner. And so um, what I wanted to do is to create some supplements for race car drivers that will help them progress in their sport. Uh, I mean, let's be honest. We're drivers, and so the only thing that really counts to us is taking number one. And so we'll do everything that it takes to be number one. Now, uh, after all of this, you're doing public speaking just before the interview started, you had mentioned you were in Boston. You're doing a speaking engagement there? Yeah, it's actually, um, we speak, we actually showed up to Boston about uh, three or four hours ago. So we took the red eye um, and flew into Boston. So we're in Boston now. Um, and so, yeah, I'm speaking in Boston. And, and then after that, we've got a race. And then after that, we've got New York City. And then, yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, it's uh, Washington D.C. Then a race, then New York City. So, so I keep busy. 
Who do you do your speaking to? Who books you for your speaking engagements? Is it medical people? It, it, you know what? There's a huge range, and that's what I think is so amazing to to having the opportunity of, of doing what I do is it's a range. You've got people that are very socially awkward and very so they're an introvert in in every form of the word um, because they are so smart and because they have the book smarts and so you know you've got the you've got the doctors that that understand the the mental disorder from what the book says um, so I speak to a lot of doctors um, on the flip side of that I speak to a lot of people who actually live the experience day to day and it's it's an amazing thing to watch as I'm speaking and I can typically pick these people these people out through the in the crowd within a matter of just a couple minutes but I can look through the crowd and I can talk about it and you can see these little mini light bulbs light up above certain people's brains and it's that moment where they where they can look and they dig down deep within themselves and understand that wow like whatever Justin is saying I'm feeling the same way and so then when I'm able to sit and talk to him I can kind of convey that it's like I saw you smile or I saw you have that that moment where where things really started making sense and so, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, that's my goal. I can't tell you how many times I've been told in this world that I can't do things. Um, this just isn't one of them. I am, I'm going to change the world. I'm going to, I'm going to be the one guy that changes the world for the best. Because that's what I want to do. I like your take on bipolar as being a blessing. I think that's a good way to approach the whole thing. And I think other people should probably t get that message from you as well, that regardless of what your situation in life is and what cards you have been dealt, that you make the most of what you've got rather than blaming yourself, feeling victimized, or worse than that, blaming other people for your shortcomings no, it, in life. You know? Yeah. Yeah, it, it, exactly. I mean, it, it, if you look at it, everybody has a struggle. Everybody does, whether it, it, it a cancer, diabetes, a cold, a flu, um, it, you know, Graves' disease, you know, autoimmune disease, whatever. Everybody in this world has something that they go through. And um, the thing with mental illness is it just so happens to be one of those disorders that people can't see like you you can see cancer you can pop up an x-ray and you can see cancer or you can see someone who has diabetes you can see those type of things right with mental disorders you can't and so that's my biggest push right now is to end the stigma give us give us the people who have the this disorder give us the opportunity to show you that we are just like you. I'm no different than anybody else. I have crazy stories. I get that I have crazy stories. But when it comes down to the deep, true part of who I am as a human, I'm no different than anybody else. My goal is to be happy every day. I have children. I have a house payment. I have a car payment. I, I live just like everybody else does. And so if I can convey to people that if you're just patient with yourself, that if you accept yourself for who you are, and mostly at the end of the day, stand up and have a voice. Stand up and if you're having a bad day, have someone that you can talk to that can help you go through that process and that struggle in life. That, for me, that was always very, very important. Um, I didn't want to go see a medical professional. I didn't want to see a doctor because I didn't want to be told what I was or who I was through the readings of a book. I wanted to understand it 
more of the readings of what I researched. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Who was it that diagnosed you with bipolar? Who decided that there was something about you that required attention? It's, uh, the, the doctor that I've had for, oh, good heavens, I think we're probably going on 27 years now. Um, I've had him for a long time. He's actually delivered three of my four children. He's an incredible man, and he does um, a lot with holistic medicine, um, a lot with herbal supplement, you know, that, that, that type of stuff. And so going to him, he's watched my ups and downs. Um, he's he has he knows my history and so being able to go to him he even told me later on that he knew that it was coming because I've always been really good at hiding any emotion or any feeling when it came to to the disorder so with me having that out and being able to talk about it now it seems to make life my life better and uh, and because of, of Stuart, um, my doctor, because of him, you know, I'm able to understand a little bit of the technology side of it as well. Um, so if I can gain some small knowledge on, on the technical side, yet huge knowledge off of the experience and living with the um, side, then, like, there'll be one day that I'll beat it. I'll, I will be the disorder. I think one of the things with mental illness that is difficult for a lot of people is that they don't understand the difference between actual mental illness, chemical imbalance, and just somebody who acts crazy, who acts erratically. Yeah. Like some people think that you have control over your behavior where in some instances you really don't. And I think your kids, I'm assuming that bipolar can be hereditary. Is that correct? Yes, yes. So with your kids, you said yes. one, of, one of them, one of your sons, uh, is kind of exhibiting the signs. I think probably the best thing for him is the fact that you know what it is and that if it gets bad, yeah. you know, you can, you'll be able to see what it is because I know people that have grown up with other d different disorders, and like the parents, they had no idea. They just thought, uh, my kid has a behavioral problem, or uh, yes, you know what I mean, ADHD or AD, yeah, right, yes. They don't really know what it is, and and in the old days, if the kid acted up and the father smacked him, as the uh, sort of <laughs> treatment for the, bad yeah, behavior, yeah, as the punishment, yeah. You know, when in fact there was something much more serious going on than just a kid who didn't know how to how to behave himself. Yeah, I um I look at it like with with my own children. You know, I wish I would have had someone that I felt comfortable enough talking to when I was growing up. Um, I do think that my life might have changed just a little bit. Um, it, you know, I mean, I can I literally can sit and talk about this stuff all night because. I've lived these stories. I know these stories by heart. And so I do have, you know, of course, a lot to say within a short amount of time. And so, the, you know, it, it can be hard. But but ultimately, what I've learned um, over the last couple years and with finishing the book and with being, uh, what's the word, um, being thrown into the fire, I guess, because I, I had absolutely no idea what it was like to be put into seminar and speaking and and public speaker. I like I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And it is it is hard. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, it's hard. But I think the the cool thing about it is it's is it's hard enough where it's gonna teach me. And I'm going to learn it. And, you know, if I don't make any money out of it, that's fine. At least I will know that I was taught. If I had a chance to do it all over again, and let's say, you know, I if the magic wand came out and said, all right, you can change anything um, that you want, what would it be? You know, I, 
think the only thing I would probably change is maybe my eye color. That's it. I have brown eyes. I want blue eyes. Well, you can everything get, else. <laughs> you can get contact <laughs> lenses for that. You could change them to any yeah, color you I know. want. I, yeah, 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 exactly. But that's um, but, but that's kind of my point is that out of all the things in this world that I could change if I had the opportunity, being you know the mental disorder or being you know having some schizophrenia or post traumatic or having some of the things that I've experienced. Instead of giving those up, I cherish those moments because those moments are the, the moments in my life that have brought me character. And I'm able to stand in front of thousands of people now and have a little bit more confidence in, in saying what I'm saying um, because I'm not so worried about going over on time or, or stuff like that. So. Well, speaking of time, we've got to wrap up the interview because we have run out of time. Bummer. Yeah. Thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. Uh, your story is very inspirational. Best of luck with all of your endeavors. How's your book doing? How's the book selling? I, you know what? The, the, the book is doing a lot better than, than I even could have even, even thought. Um, we did hit the bestseller list um, about four weeks ago. Great. Um, so, uh, I mean, the book was only out for about a month and a week, and we've already had the bestseller list on it. So, it's been fun. It's here again. It's been hard, but it it definitely has been a fun and challenging experience for me. And the book is available on Amazon, I assume. Yes, yes. So, so available on Amazon. Um, it's the, the best place to get it is off my website, and that way I have a little bit of control. Um, with with when they're shipped out and how they're shipped out. <laughs> Plus, I like to sign the books as well. Oh, great. Um, you know, I don't sign them all, but, but I like to at least, you know, sign them and, and, you know, put a little bit of words of advice or something um, because I've, I've found that if you do that, people will read them. What is your well, website? Uh, so the website is justinpeck.com. Um, last name is spelled P-E-C-K, and uh, first name Justin, J-U-S-T-I-N. You related to Gregory and, Peck? And, uh, <laughs> you know what? Man, that is the funniest thing. You, literally, I'm not joking. You are the fourth person in two days who has asked me that same question. Uh, I wish I was, because Gregory Peck, he was a rock star. Oh, yeah. That guy, was, he, was pre- he was pretty awesome. He was an amazing so. actor. Yeah. yeah. Yes, amazing actor for sure. All right, Justin. Well, we've got to wrap this up. Thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. And again, best of luck with all Well, that. I appreciate the opportunity. Well, that's about all the time we've got for the show today. I want to thank my special guest, Justin Peck. And thank you to George Hendrickson and to the Mystics for the music. This is Douglas Coleman saying goodbye. i